This is the wall that surrounds the Gaza Strip and cuts off nearly two million Palestinians from the outside world. This story began a decade ago, on the road to the Erez border crossing, dividing Israel and Gaza. It's one of the most heavily fortified and eerie frontiers in the world. George? Yeah. You know, you can't uh, take picture of yeah. not possible. Uh. I'm a photojournalist and filmmaker. I've been covering Gaza for 30 years. Entering Gaza requires passing through a series of remotely operated gates and closed to all but a handful of people with permits. Entering here is a privilege of sorts. Ra'ad Thamna, my colleague and friend, is always waiting for me on the other side. Somehow he's survived six wars. Keep back me, Alhamdulillah, yes, He hasn't been allowed to leave this plot of Mediterranean coast for 25 years. Ra'ad is a fixer. His job is helping foreign newsmen like me get their stories. We've been working together since 2003. Ra'ad has saved me from stone throwers, wrestled armed men, and gotten me inside places militants insisted were off limits, all without a byline or a bulletproof vest. He's an unsung hero of journalism. We met in 2003, a happier time, when Gaza's freedom seemed within reach. But over the years, feature stories gave way to hard news. These days in Gaza, there are two lines of steady work, the gun business and the news business. Years ago, I saw Ra'ad daily, but now I see him when there's a crisis. And over the years, I've seen a saddening change in Ra'ad's face. I'm returning now for the first time since the summer 2014 war. Israel pulverized Gaza for 50 days, killing more than 2,100 Palestinians, leaving more than 11,000 people wounded. Gaza City's oldest neighborhood, Sujayye, became a killing field. There's still tension in the air.
كل فلسطيني كل فلسطيني فينا مستهدف لهدول الناس بيعشقوا شرب الدم بيجوا شرب الدم بس بدي اقول لك حاجه واحده جور صدقني 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 هذا بيولد الكره لاسرائيل ويوما ما حت الى ازاله ازاله الاحتلال هذا بقول لهم ايش بيسووا في ابائهم واولادهم واخوانهم واجدادهم كيف بيبيدوا عائلات كامله وبدمروا بيوتها اذا بيضل كل طفل فلسطيني بينشا وبيكبر بيضل عنده فكره ايش سوى الاحتلال حتى الى الى يوم من ازاله هذا الاحتلال لا حجر ولا شجر حتى بيوت الله مش سلم منهم ولا حد بيسلم من هذا الاحتلال Like my camera, Ra'ed's car is vital to our working together. A new tribe, but you have a new tribe now? Of course, my father will in the car, yeah, and he's coming to buy it. But it's always breaking down. You know what's happening with my car yesterday at no. 9 o'clock in my evening? No. You see, two, do you see this car? This one, this is my car. You see, Kaushuk, what do you mean? Yeah. Inside is fire, fire, no fire, fire, nar, nar. Ah. Oh, I might with water, broke it because, shh, you know, and this broke it all back the car. As much as I empathize with these breakdowns, they're a distraction from our assignment. But more significantly, Ra'id's wife, seven children, and 42 other members of his family, broke and out of work, depend on his job and his car for their food and clothing. The job is so critical, Majid, Ra'id's father and clan patriarch, came to oversee the repair. This one's from where? From China? No, Germany, not China here. It's second hand. If you want to be a brand new, you want to go to uh, Mercedes company. <laughs> yeah, we get him to buy for you this one. The Israeli blockade strictly controls everything which enters Gaza, making car parts hard to find. Take your next job, we're going to make you a oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You want to teach me this good? Yeah. You want to teach me a long time to be a cameraman. When I be a cameraman, it's great for me. Yeah. Use it, this works. When you tie out something, I use it. The 2006 war was the first one we covered together, on assignment with the New York Times. Israel invaded the northern Gaza Strip and overran Ra'id's hometown, Beit Hanun. So what happened exactly? Israeli now destroys the houses, destroys the road, and get inside the houses. What about your house? My, my, uh, not my house, my family's house, uncle, my uncle house, it's really damaged. One wall, two walls inside rooms. I don't know what's happening now in this moment because I don't hear any news about my house. Nobody answered the phones. I don't know nothing about my family house. We spent four days trying to get inside Ra'id's besieged hometown. When the Israeli army withdrew, we rushed to examine the damage with our reporters. I think if you weren't afraid, it would be crazy. I mean, you know. Oh, so it's not normal, but you are not afraid. Normal. I'm afraid. I just. No. He's just quiet about it. I'm just quiet about it. Of course so I'm afraid. Why do I express myself? Hello, hello. 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 Yeah, 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 okay. this woman. Yeah, cool, of course, have a bag. As the sun set, rockets and artillery started flying over our heads. Saur, Saur. What are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, they're burning the Quran. Why? Why are they burning? Yeah, the Quran? Why are they burning? Yeah, the Quran. 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 Why are they burning? Yeah,
it's much better to burn it than to throw it away. I'm scared. I want to get married before I die. If I don't do that, I'm scared. I want to get married before I die. If I don't do that, I'm here comes another one. That night, I lay awake with the sound of Israeli drones circling overhead. I was thinking about the story. I had no idea that by morning, the story would be Ra'at himself. Ra'at didn't show up for our 7 a.m. appointment. I called, but he didn't answer. I heard Beit Hanun had been hit. Worried, I rushed to Ra'at's doorstep. I don't know, just I see all of pieces. Just I go to hospital, I don't see anybody still alive. All, all of them is dead, all of them. Hours after declaring a ceasefire, Israeli artillery fired a high explosive round into Beit Hanun that landed on one of the Athamna homes. Shocked from their sleep, the family scrambled out of their beds and into the alleyway below. The battery quickly fired 14 more shells, killing 18 of Ra'id's relatives and gravely wounding more than 40 others. Briefly, Ra'id's loss was the top news story around the world. More bad news from Gaza. Look. Look, that's it, thanks. What you do here? What you do here? Look. Look over there. Look over there. Can you look here? Can you look here? Can you feel me everything? Ra'id spun in circles on the roof as Israeli drones circled overhead. How, you, how I want, I forget 18, 18 dead. How I forget 18? How I forget 18? 18, most of them, kids and women and old people. How 18 years, 16 years, 17 years, eight months, one, uh, one and a half months. How I forget? No way, no way. No way for, to forget, no way to forget anybody from this country. No way. The next afternoon, we walk with the bodies to a burial ground on the outskirts of town. At the gravesite, I looked in vain for Ra'id, but found his father Majid and his brother Ayid. Ra'id was back at work just days after the massacre. The survivors depended on his earnings to live. And when there's a war in Gaza, there's always work for fixers like Ra'id. Every once in a while, through his pain and shock, Ra'id's sense of humor resurfaced. Ahmad, first one is wounded. When the, uh, the first one, my, uh, my uncle, he's get, get Ahmad and send you want ambulance to get Ahmad. It's not badly, Ahmad walking. In the shelling, Ra'id's cousin Ahmed was buried under rubble, still conscious but unable to speak, while both his parents, killed in the shelling, lay nearby. Thinking he was dead, medics placed him inside the hospital mortuary among the corpses. <laughs> No way to get me, because it's still him, it's martyr, yeah. Where does he want to go? No, no, he wants to stay here, don't want to go any place. Yeah. I, don't give him, I don't give him to go any place. All of them moving. Yalla, salam. 
Our first assignment after the massacre was to check reports that a British memorial cemetery had been damaged. <laughs> While I was filming the broken tombstones, Ra'ed drifted away. Within the cemetery walls, Ra'ed rested and found some temporary peace. For a few minutes, I forgot all about my assignment. It was a moment I wanted to last. The news story could wait for another day. War returned to Gaza just two years later in January 2009. Ra'ed hit an all-time low. After the alleyway massacre, the Athamnas left Beit Hanun and regrouped in a safer spot, 10 miles further south, in the hamlet of Abu Durabo. Just months after they settled in, Israeli forces invaded and overran the area. For seven days, the family was trapped inside their homes. Bombardments left four of their homes damaged. On the eighth day, the family emerged at dawn with their hands in the air, holding a white flag. All 50 survived and fled in shock to Beit Hanun. When the war ended, they returned to find all seven homes destroyed. Ra'ed's home, the homes of his six brothers and his parents, and Ra'ed's Mercedes crushed by a tank, leaving him homeless, penniless, and unemployed. I found him living in a tent on the wreckage of his home with his clan. As we were having breakfast, a Hamas organizer came to the tent offering food coupons. Ra'ed's loyalty wasn't for sale. The stress was so acute, he lost his photographic memory. But in a strange twist of fate, the answer to one of his problems fell from the sky. When Ra'ed's story aired on Norwegian TV, the Norwegian Taxi Drivers Association was so moved they pulled together an astonishing $35,000 to buy Ra'ed a new car. But the only vehicle he could find to meet the international standards required to receive the money was a luxury Mercedes. You know, Ra'ed now different than Ra'ed before. Oh. It's okay, it was... You know what? Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> to protect the car, he parked it next to the tent and sometimes inside it. But owning a luxury automobile while living in a tent was awkward. People assumed he was rich. and inside the bank handling aid for destroyed homes, there was a greater frustration. Ra'ed had to prove home ownership but his documents were buried under tons of rubble. 
استاذ استاذ يعطيك العافيه يعطيك العافيه قلبوا مش تغلبوا يلا شو بدك؟ عم اهلك عم اهلك عم اهلك بس بالراحه 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 حد انت ابوس على راسك انا من بدرحل اللي بدحلوني عشان خاطر النمره بتاعتي بدرحل تعمل لي زي هيك يا اخوي تعمل لي زي هيك اسكت 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 بقول لك اسكت بقول لك اسكت اسكت لو انك ما After several months of driving one of the nicest cars in Gaza, Ra'ad made the hard decision to sacrifice the Mercedes, to use as a deposit, and move his extended family into a stable home. One day, Ra'ad drove us to his dream house. It cost a seemingly unreachable $100,000. But by selling the car, he had a huge down payment. You see it? This is my new house. Which one? The... You see the, the white one? This one. This, this, one? Yeah, this, this on one. the corner? No, no this one. This white one here? Yeah, this beautiful. one. This oh, one. Beautiful. beautiful. You see this one? Yeah. yeah. Ra'ad, his wife, his children, and 20 other Athamna relatives moved in. And it came just in time. Just as he closed the deal on the house, Ra'id's wife, Ihtiram, went into labor with her eighth child. As tradition holds, Ra'id bought a chicken dinner feast. <laughs> Mejdi Ra'da Thamna was born in peacetime on May 10th, 2009, under a solid roof. It was a rare moment of pure joy in Ra'da's life, and probably the happiest I've ever seen him. I left Ra'id, but I knew I'd see him for the next war. I just didn't know when it was coming. I've covered the news in Gaza for the past decade with Ra'ad Athamna, my driver, fixer, and friend. I rejoined him after the 2014 summer war. <laughs> when not a war story, news in Gaza is often the struggle between political parties, Hamas and Fatah. University students are marking the 10th anniversary of the death of iconic Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, Fatah's founding father. If you want to get to high place, be great for us. Yeah, if you want to get to high place, let's go to high place. I'm filming from upstairs. Though ousted from power by Hamas, Fatah supporters are out in force today. As much as anything, to prove they're still here.
At night we went to see a victory rally. The Hamas rocket brigade is celebrating what it sees as achievements in this war. The crowd is enthusiastic about these crude, tiny rockets, which, although ineffective, are Gaza's only way of physically striking back at Israel. But many other people resent the massive retaliation these rockets bring down on them. An increasing number of Gazans support neither party. <laughs> Monday morning in Gaza City. Life is beginning to return to normal, but there's tension in the air. is keeping people from interfering with filming. Who's good at it? <laughs> This is Ra'ed's first paid assignment in months. And with some cash to spend, he's bent on throwing a big family lunch. Chickens become a luxury. Spices are expensive and hard to find. <laughs> After the massacre of 2006 and the destruction of their homes in 2009, I was happy to see Ra'ed's home survive this time. But Ra'ed wanted to show me something. I'm going to my uh, uh, girl's room, destroyed by uh, tank and bulldozer. Enter uh, the special forces to my, to my home. You see, like this, bulldoze the room by this way and enter the Israelis inside, the soldier inside my room, my house, and destroy it, my girl's room like this way. Shadi. Ah. While most Gazans are refugees from other parts of Palestine, 
Ra'ed's family are native Gazans. Theirs is a clan-based society. People from their town are famous for being tough and hard-headed. Maybe that helps them. Ra'ed and Ihtiram share their home with their seven children and Ra'ed's mother-in-law, her oldest son, and his family of six. Ra'ed's eldest daughter, Renine, inherited Ra'ed's photographic memory. Her remarkable high school test scores were the second highest in the Gaza Strip. But today she's unemployed and has just lost her house in the war. Ihtiram doesn't leave the house the way she used to. She feels uneasy outside since this last conflict. She watches over their children, Mejdi and Mariam. Mejdi, born just after the 2009 war, is now five. This masjid chicken. Just only have one now. It's one chicken. Uh, I think it's, it wants to be seven, like seven, eight chicken before the world. But when you leave the house 51 days, some of them die because no food, no eat. Still one, still, still alive, this one. Hello. And this is meat, it's peladi, it's mean handmade chicken, not like it's market chicken, it's more, it's good meat for us. They must have some work before, but now it's not so much. But maybe 5% now. Well, why do you think? Because it's more difficult oh. to come inside? Um, I'm thinking it's first things more difficult to come to Gaza and not easy for from Israeli side to come to give him the uh, Bitegaron or Tbrishkar to give him Tbrishkar to come to Gaza. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy for Jordanians to come. 
And you know, the revolution in the Middle East, in, in the Arab countries, is happening in Syria and Tunisia and Libya, Egypt. It's give the journalists to, 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 to look so much about this revolution and seven between Daesh and like this, in Iraq, Syria, Syria, Lebanon, uh, everywhere in the, in the Arab country has something to happen. Maybe to taking so, not care about Gaza so much like because it has a lot of things to do in, in the Middle East. How many days a month? How many days a month? How many days a month? became four days a month before. Before, now, maybe two, every two months, one day, two days, that's maybe, or maybe not. Well, Ra'id wonders how he'll find work and fix the hole in the side of his house. Fatima, his mother-in-law, is worse off still. Just, uh, Ra'ed helps her salvage anything she can from her home. So many homes were hit by Israel's bombardments, up to half a million, or almost 30% of residents were displaced. Six months after the war's end, the UN said it couldn't repair Gazan homes because donors had failed to pay the funds they had pledged. School children, shopkeepers, professionals, and grandparents have been reduced to scavenging reusable bricks and pieces of twisted metal. B 
Being in the extreme north of Gaza, Beit Hanun is right up against the Israeli separation wall, making it a prime launching ground for Qassam rockets. It often takes the brunt of the fighting. Ra'ed's teenage sons, Majid and Maher, aren't scholars like their sister, Renin. They got into a lot of fights growing up. Both are jobless, so Ra'ed is struggling to pay installments to keep them in community college. One potential employer, a major armed faction, has offered them a salary of $200 a month, plus a scooter and a Klashnikov, if they sign up. Ra'ad has rigged a car battery to power a tiny lamp because the power is out. Nine of Gaza's ten electrical lines no longer work. But that's not what's gnawing at him. What do you think is the bigger danger? Maher or...? Uh... Oh, oh, between Maher and uh, Majid is one year. Same, same age. And this, uh, one is 18, one is 20, one 19 and a half. It's not so much between him, you know. It's most of them danger. Both of them. Both of them dangerous. It's his, his age dangerous. Not my kids dangerous. His age is dangerous. Like it's in, in Gaza, it's very, it's very dangerous at age. <laughs> my kids grow, grow up. Uh, now his age is very, very dangerous age. You want to, must look for, uh, with him well. You must care about him so much. I don't want to lose my kids in this age. Because then, it's, you know, you know what's going on. Uh, I want to, I want to, want to especially, I don't want to be him with the parties, with the faction, like this. No. I want to think about my kids in this age. Be careful. Don't stay a long time outside. You must to stay at the maximum until 7. You must to go back. Don't tell me this is my friends, blah, blah. It's not, not, not this, this situation. And almost on cue, as we were driving home, we ran into new recruits for the Kassam Brigades. Mejdi is coming to work with his father for the first time. Our last assignment is to film a series of sculptures inspired by the war. It's rare for Mejdi to get time alone like this with his father. (laughs) 
Leaving Gaza, I always feel a nagging sense of betrayal. Watching the door close on Ra'ed and close to two million people. Ra'ed has seen the destruction of everything we in the outside world take for granted. He's resilient against impossible odds. He deserves to be free. <laughs>